I think it goes without saying, we have all noticed during COVID, we have all witnessed, been a part of, or seen from the sidelines, social movements. Obviously BLM comes to the front of mind, but also I would even put like anti-mask sort of protests in a social movement category. But even before that, I would say like even before COVID, um, at least in Canada, we, in Canada, we were having a pretty big indigenous uprising. I would say, and we still are, uh, but everything just kind of got put on pause when COVID happened. But so social movements have been a really big thing in Canada over the past like four years, I would say. Um, so triggered by this, I decided to do a little research into how violence plays a part as a protest tactic in not the success of the movement, but how the movement is consumed and responded to by the state or whoever it's being leveraged against. But in indigenous circumstances, it is the settler colonial state, nine times out of 10. I do wanna make my positionality really clear before even diving into it, because I don't want it to seem like I'm um, giving prescriptions for what indigenous movements should do. I have no say in that. I couldn't even have a full understanding. I use she, her pronouns. I am a female identifying cisgender woman. I am queer and I am white. I am of English and Scottish ancestry. And my family initially came to um, like the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee territory in Ontario. That's where they settled. And then I lived there for a good portion of my life. And I've also lived in other areas. And I would really like to acknowledge the territory, but I also want to um, keep my privacy and security uh, protected. So, and I, I think it's pretty common knowledge that I currently live on the land of the Songhees and Wissanich First Nations. So I'm very grateful to be a guest on these territories. And I feel like I learned so much from indigenous theorists and artists and regular people every day uh, through my work, through my academic life, through just my social life. Anyways, let's just dive into it. So I'm first gonna go over social mobilization theory. Why does that happen in democracy and outside of democracies? Definitely, let's be clear there. Um, yeah, specifically within a democracy, so. It is posited that democracy as a form of socio-political organization has the potential to provide social cohesion while protecting individual liberty. However, democracy's majoritarian principle can also reproduce, re in brackets, like it can produce as in generate or reproduce as in perpetuate hegemonic privilege at the expense of dissenting minorities. So that's basically the um, tyranny of the majority to condense that down. This representational deficiency compels, not the time for my supervisor to be messaging me. Yes. So this representational deficiency compels minority groups to pursue their visions of justice outside electoral channels, often leading to attention-seeking acts such as dis civil disobedience. Not attention-seeking in like, you know, the teenage way, <laughs> but in the bringing attention to our issues and our voices and our lived experiences sort of way. Particularly within settler colonial countries, the voices most often repressed are those with original title to the paramount resource of territory. And territory must be understood as a resource on multiple levels. Um, First Nations' continued presence and resistance mires the settler state with existential anxiety. The colonial logic of elimination undergirds ongoing systemic strategies of assimilation and erasure. George Manuel Sequemic maintains, however, that these schemes have continuously been met with creative indigenous resistance and independent assertions of sovereignty that defy the state's constructed authority of legitimizing recognition. That's, I feel like it needs to be unpacked a bit. So it's kind of a lot to dive into, but basically the settler colonial state is always invested in erasing indigenous bodies and indigenous life and existence and sovereignty. So it's erasing the threat that indigenous existence poses to settler sovereignty over the resource and the capital of territory and, you know, national identity, really everything. It's like indigenous identity is such an existential threat to the state. 
vocalizing debate within social movement theory considers the efficacy of violence versus nonviolence. The former violence is typically attributed to civil resistance against undemocratic regimes, while the latter, nonviolence, is often associated with civil disobedience within a democracy. Mobilizations of indigenous sovereignty and social capital are repressed systematically by the settler colonial regime, which leads it to frame such movements as threats to uninational security via a discourse of violence that renews savagery stereotypes. I intend to expand upon this then by using a decolonial lens to comparative analyze the development of the Red Power Movement, or the RPM, of the 1960s and 1970s in the US, and the Idle No More Movement, or INM, of 2012 and 2013 in Canada, and arguably ongoing. Considering my positionality, this research has helped me interrogate my long-conditioned understanding of the relationship between violence and disobedience. Far from the universal and categorical allegorical dichotomy it is painted as, obedience often upholds violence, which raises the important questions of obedience to whom and for whom. In comparing the Red Power Movement to Idle no, Poor, no More, it is crucial to resist equivocating the historical context of the countries they originated in, which are indeed similar but also crucially distinctive. In the United States, indigenous resistance to settler expansion sparked the Indian Wars, which carried throughout the 17th and 19th centuries and ended with the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. From this point forward, the settler government adopted an assimilation strategy that systematized the colonial logic of elimination until it was challenged during the revolutionary fever of the 1970s. The peak of unrest was in the generational wake of the 1953 House Concurrent Resolution 108, which advanced total assimilation as an end to the Indian problem, calling for the immediate disassembly of reservations and the ceasing of federal services and protections in order to eliminate all autonomy embedded in land claims and treaty rights. Remember this. <laughs> While the policy of termination did devastate rural communities, it also brought indigenous masses to the cities and consequently facilitated the emergence of a strong urban pan-indigenous collective empowered to seek justice. Radicalized by termination, police brutality, over-incarceration, and unemployment in the 1960s, the Black Power Movement's message of ethnic nationalism inspired the uneducated urban indigenous communities. As the National Indian Youth Council began articulating a vision of self-determination, the group Indians of all tribes nestled itself as the heart of the emerging Red Power Movement when they took over Alcatraz Island, announcing reclamation and emphasizing the deserted prison's ironic likeness to reservations. Although the occupation only lasted for a few hours, its successful garnering of attention was noted by another emerging group that came to define the Red Power Movement, the American Indian Movement. So the American Indian Movement was within the larger Red Power Movement, kind of like the Black Panthers within the Black Power Movement. AIM formed, so AIM, the American Indian Movement, AIM formed in, Minian in Minneapolis, in Minneapolis <laughs> with the mission of protecting indigenous people from police brutality and over-incarceration, adopting the Black Panther Party's community self-defense defense patrol style. With rapid national chapter proliferation and popularity gain, it quickly centered itself as the organizational expression of the Red Power Movement. Acting as a local social service of sorts, it aided community members in job searches, education attainment, and loan bargaining, while pursuing an ultimate vision of cultural preservation and disavowal of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA. Remember that. Five years after the original Alcatraz invasion, AIM organized a second occupation that lasted 19 months. This occupation drew attention to the policy of termination and insisted on the establishment of indigenous colleges, museums, cultural centers, and other preservation programs. The US government did not address these demands or attempt to remove the protesters, but instead took on a standby approach that proved successful when AIM eventually lost the social capital of public captivation as the press moved on. Despite this ultimate succession, Secession? Se secession? And President Richard Nixon, eager to aid the indigenous population as a safe minority that, unlike African Americans, did not seek integration, he urged Congress to pass eight bills rejecting termination, promoting tribal autonomy, and strengthening the BIA. Despite these reforms' progressive appearance, Nixon's slogan of self determination without termination disappointed radicals who desired treaty re renegotiation and emancipation from the BIA as a structure of Anglo wardship and normalized colonialism. In response to Nixon's seeming attempt to neutralize these concerns, the RPM gained collective capacity and a greater willingness to engage in confrontational actions. AIM, never too concerned with the principle of nonviolence, encouraged civil disobedience as a core strategy of liberation, which came to shape the repertoire of contentious action that defined the Red Power Movement and predetermined both its efficacy and its ultimate downfall. 
In Canada, the settlement process was uneven but continuous. The settler government announced its sovereignty by virtue of the Doctrine of Discovery, first through the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and then through the British North America Act, later becoming the Confederation Act, in 1867. Its initial legislative attempts at indigenous assimilation and elimination were eventually amalgamated under the Indian Act of 1876, which seeks to control every aspect of indigenous life, and continues to. In 1969, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, dad of Justin Trudeau, the current prime minister, proposed the White Paper on Indian Policy, which very much resembled the United States House Concurrent Resolution 108 of 1953. In its attempt to terminate all federal responsibility and special accommodations for First Nations, including reservations, Indian status, and Indian affairs. Maybe I'll do a whole video on the White Paper actually and why that's bad because it might not be clear at face value. Its assimilation is getting rid of all of Indigenous people's special rights. This political declaration seemed to empower many to pursue greater articulation and protection of these special rights through judicial political channels, resulting in a slew of lawsuits that produced widespread reform. Adding Section 35 to the Constitution Act in 1982, recognizing existing Aboriginal treaty rights. Bill C-31 in 1995, restoring the status of some Aboriginal women forming the 1996 Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples to investigate the Indian Act, and the 1999 First Nations Land Management Act, allowing a limited form of self-government, uh, among other legislation. Arthur Manuel, who's Sequetmic, cautions that despite this progress, every move forward has been accompanied by caveats that delimit the full expression of any right that could potentially threaten state sovereignty, which effectively further system systematizes colonialism under an image of conscientious reform. As a result, state institutions have low legitimacy within Indigenous communities, and this illegitimacy norm produces a collective inclination towards engaging in extra-institutional action without requiring the stimulus of new threats to political or material resources. So it was within this context of historically grounded discontent that I don't know more arose. So compared to the uh, Red Power Movement, I don't know more had a much softer emergence. It began as a series of emails between a group of Cree women, Nina Wilson, Sylvia McAdam, and Jessica Gordon, and one white settler woman, Sheila McLean, in Saskatchewan, who sought to contest the omnibus Bill C-45. Now, Bill C-45 proposed a series of unilateral amendments to various environmental protection acts that would have significant repercussions for Indigenous nations and their treaty rights. Wilson, McAdam, Gordon, and McLean started a Facebook page that quickly garnered mass support, and by the late fall of 2012, hashtag I don't know more had become a popular social media campaign, as well as the focus of contentious political debate in Canada. It is something from, what, the late 19th century, which at the time, is it racist? I don't think so. Is it colonial? No. Is it, colonial is something very specific. I wish I had been more on the scene in 2012, really, to to have like firsthand witnessed this, but I was in grade eight. <laughs> Although specifically arising to contest Bill C-45, the movement's rapid gathering of support led to a strategic broadening of its goals, nesting the targeted mission within the larger imperatives of environmental preservation, indigenous sovereignty, and colonial status quo disruption. The first site-based collective action was a mass teach-in in Saskatoon on November 10th, which precipitated a series of other protests and rallies. On December 11th, International Human Rights Day, uh, Mushkego Cree Chief Teresa Spence of the Ottawa Piscot First Nation, uh, which is located on James Bay, Northern Ontario, capitalized on the juncture between symbolism, momentum, and media attention by beginning a hunger strike to solicit a meeting with the Prime Minister Stephen Harper and the Governor General David Johnson in regards to rectifying Treaty 9 infringements. At times I feel like more like a slave than a person the way the Prime Minister treats, treats us as First Nations. Spence's peaceful resistance imbued calls for justice with greater urgency, and soon the movement's message spilt over into the international arena, becoming a powerful fourth world social movement in which other indigenous nations felt empowered to demand respect for their inherent rights. So following the Alcatraz occupation and subsequent Nixon reforms, AIM leaders, like those of the Black Power Movement, realized that the most effective way to capture and maintain visibility and relevancy was through confrontational politics that drew press coverage, for better or worse. <laughs> Russell Means, who is Okalala Lakota, a prominent AIM leader, explained, quote, the only way we could get publicity was by threats. We had to threaten the institutions we were trying to change, end quote. In November of 1972, they initiated their second mass direct action, the Trail of Broken Treaties, a cross-country caravan collecting hundreds of supporters to stage events in Washington, D.C. A central objective was to prevent their focalizing 20 points document to the government, which cumulatively called for the restoration of Indian treaty-making authority and dissolution of the BIA. The action's intent was nonviolence, but a series of miscommunications led to their hostile takeover of the BIA headquarters, which lasted seven days. 
They left eventually after being paid $66,000 and promised that their demands would be given formal attention. While the occupation did put a spotlight on the RPM, images of $2 million worth of damages to the building and stolen files released after their departure were what endured in the public mind rather than the purpose of the action. So we're seeing here some of the downsides to uh, violent action. This prevailing image eroded support from both the American and Native American public as they became associated with reckless violence and militancy. This also led Nixon to frustratedly abandon Native American issues as a policy focus, and indeed represented a decisive turning point in the RPM. Its objectives and methods were cognitively separated from popular conceptions of justice, and consequently heightened calls for settler colonial law and order. Both informing and informed by popular sentiment, the relationship between AIM and the press began to decay after the trail. However, they did retain relevance as a news item, and exploded back onto the scene a year later with their most infamous action the occupation of Wounded Knee. In response to community requests to highlight tribal government corruption, 300 armed Oglala Lakota AIM activists traveled to Wounded Knee where they set up roadblocks, took over the trading post and church, and announced it a liberated territory. Despite the site's extraordinary symbolic significance, limiting the socially acceptable paths of action the government could take in response, they were also highly motivated by concerns that the powerful movement would initiate a true revolution or erosion of government legitimacy and authority. These concerns led the government to run the risk of condemnation and respond with crushing force, surrounding Wounded Knee with masses of FBI agents, federal marshals, BIA police, and tribal police, who took the lives of two activists, wounded several others, and eventually arrested 120 people. Perhaps to counteract the public denunciation of this violent suppression, Congress approved a string of Indian reforms between 1973 and 1975, restoring terminated tribes and approving the Indian Financing Act and Indian Self-Determination Education Act. This reformist response showed that despite AIM's post-trail loss of public support due to media stereotyping and lawlessness and factionalism frames within the media, uh, Native American activists had successfully drawn political gains by appealing to the sympathies of the American public by capitalizing on the symbolic irony of the wounded knee situation. Alcatraz had incentivized the president to articulate an intention regarding indigenous rights, but wounded knee really pushed Congress to begin implementing it in earnest. Compared to AIM's violent guidance of the RPM, I Don't Know More remained committed to a non-violence principle that informed its performance strategy and brief place-based actions that invoked the language of occupation rather than the protracted presence. Much like Gandhi, <laughs> Idle No More's leaders posited nonviolence as a code of conduct that drew on the spiritual strength of self-suffering and a doctrine of love to bring about sovereignty, or home rule, or Hind Swaraj. It had also allowed connection to the environmental movement and leftist ideology as a whole, which furnished partnerships with other renowned activists and effectively brought in their support base, but also diluted their message into global news coverage. While the RPM was characterized by a paradoxically violent sympathy-gathering strategy of action that focalized around their original demands, I Don't Know More was focused on a non-violent, alliance-based development strategy that gained wide support at the expense of co-opting their initiating demands to a degree. Regardless, the political capital of this broad support base was evident on the Global Day of Action in Solidarity on January 13th, 2013, which saw rallies in Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and the US. Months later, the leaders organized the Sovereignty Summer Campaign to publicize their list of six demands invoking the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, henceforth under it, uh, free prior informed consent. Jarrett Martineau, who's Plains Cree, explains that while these representational gestures of Indigenous resistance and struggle continuity produced effective appeal, their fleeting temporality limited their ability to bring about systemic change. The hypervisibility and technological reliance of this previously private court-based struggle made Indigenous repertoires of contentious action legible and therefore vulnerable to state surveillance and repression. And that's just an opinion. <laughs> Following Wounded Knee, the Red Power Movement began to fade as a direct action movement, shifting to the type of legal judicial activism that characterized the pre-Idle No More era in Canada, but critically with less independent prerogative AIM members arrested at Wounded Knee were forced into court battles that the government prolonged in order to weaken and bankrupt the organization. This first government repression tactic was buttressed by an FBI Cointelpro infiltration scheme that served to foster paranoia within AIM and compound internal divisions. Although AIM did not achieve its original desires of BIA and abolishment and treaty renegotiation, the RPM as a whole did result in policy changes that brought greater power and attention to First Nations in the US. <laughs> 
While the Red Pirate Movement resulted in sweeping policy changes, Idle No More seemed to plateau and fade from the media spotlight. And it, it still comes around. Scholars such as Taiki Alfred, who is Mohawk, and Arthur Manuel, so Kutmik, believe that this was due to the fact that Chief Spence, having been granted a meeting with the Harper government, but not the Governor General, of great symbolic significance, eventually joined with the Assembly of First Nations and the opposition parties to draft and sign a reformist 13-point declaration that outlined steps forward and divided movement supporters. Despite once again bringing attention to Canada's colonial mistreatment of Indigenous peoples, the initial expression of the movement had not succeeded in stopping the legislation it rose to contest. Scholars such as Jarrett Martineau also find that I don't know more social media based organization allowed for the neutralizing control of radicalism within colonial capitalist media, media's networked logics, facilitating state surveillance and anticipation of actions. And indeed, it did lead to uh, Project Sitka, the RCMP surveillance unit later on. Um, a significant, maybe the next year actually, <laughs> a significant challenge for Idle No More was coordinating between social media's temporal support and offline place-based organizing within an economy of fleeting attention. Following a final National Day of Action on January 16th, there was a decline in direct action as leaders called for the movement to scale back and relocalize action within communities, which the mainstream media took as a sign of cessation. However, Idle No More did not die. It reconstructed itself as the Indigenous Nationhood Movement, which continues to champion a reclaim, rename, reoccupy mission. Pamela Palmater, Mi'kmaq, asserts that, asserts that I Don't Know More was never meant to be a flashing one month then go away. This is something that's years in the making. You'll see it take different forms at different times, but it's not going away anytime soon, end quote. Palmater, alongside other Indigenous feminists, such as Leanne Simpson, Anishinaabe, and Dori Nason, Anishinaabe, claim that the female-led grassroots nature of such movements are what imbibe decolonization with such transformative potential. Furthermore, the movement provoked a massive transformation of Indigenous representation in Canada, leading to the genesis of CBC Indigenous, flooding the Canadian arts scene with decolonial work, and creating room for critical alliances and discussions regarding settler colonialism and Indigenous resurgence. Despite the passing of Bill C-45, I Don't Know More was and is the largest sustained Indigenous nationhood movement to arise in response to oppressive colonial legislation since the proposed White Paper of 1969. Comparing the use of violence and nonviolence between the Red Power Movement and I Don't Know More is a useful way of exploring how the settler state responds to different expressions of Indigenous sovereignty. As the RPM progressed from Alcatraz to the Trail of Broken Treaties to Wounded Knee, it adopted increasingly violent direct action methods that surprisingly did not cause a complete erosion of support, likely due to the powerful symbolism of the Wounded Knee site and the government's violent response. The true cause of their decline was incorporation into the policy mainstream, which eroded incentive and government repression, which eroded resources. Comparatively, I Don't Know More was a decentralized movement of nonviolent resistance marked by brief performance-based physical interventions that, although also misrepresented by the media, managed to attract a diverse support base both domestically and internationally. In some ways, its rise in popularity paradoxically contributed to its failure in terms of stopping Bill C-45. That focalizing goal was subsumed within the larger, less immediately actualizable language of self-determination as the movement entered the fourth world sphere of political dispute. Furthermore, this broadening of the struggle identity also incorporated non-Indigenous environmentalists with less explicitly decolonial agendas. However, it is impossible to make definitive statements regarding the effects of this massive network creation as a more open and conscientious government than Harper's might have responded more actively to the widespread external pressure. Comparing the policy reform initiated by the Red Power Movement's centralized leadership and the sustained solidarity network created through Idle No More's dynamic character might suggest that a combination strategy of direct action-based civil resistance could most peacefully and productively pressure settler governments to accept and engage with Indigenous sovereignty assertions. So, whether violent or nonviolent, Indigenous social movements create critical moments of acute attention to seams in the political power matrix, which have the potential to widen and produce new forms of peaceful relationality. The two forms of protest also importantly do not exist in isolation of each other. Glenn Coulthard, who is Yellow, Yellow Knives Denae, importantly notes that preceding most nonviolent negotiations are so-called violent disruptions of the colonial status quo. The transformative potentiality embedded in fourth world nations' calls for self-determination explains why they are often met with confusion and apprehension, as there is no designated place for them in the state-centric international system. Indigenous movements, therefore, face unique challenges that require them to assert resistant subjectivities through their ontological practices and be more flexible than the colonial homo homeostatic logics that try to absorb them.
Alfred argues that due to the systemic proclivity for absorption, Indigenous social movements must formulate a dynamic land-based strategy of action that includes political, economic, social, and legal resistance schemes. Supported by an anti-colonial, mission-driven solidarity network, this comprehensive land-based strategy of action could pave a politics of sustainable self-determination that the settler colonial government will not be able to recognize, redefine, or invalidate out of its way. Huzzah. Hi. I just wanted to put in a few disclaimers and I'm putting them at the end of the video because the video is so long and I also like the artsy intro. Number one, your inclination is correct. The video is sped up. I apologize. I had an hour of footage originally and I knew no one was even going to click on the video. It would be a literal documentary. I'm just hoping that if you're interested, you pause on sections, especially where there's written text and uh read it. <laughs> I know the language is complex in parts. I am also sorry for this. I'm not trying to be pretentious. The whole point of these videos is to make these like larger concepts digestible. <laughs> in the future, I will definitely be using more simple language. The only reason it's so complex is because I was literally reading word for word an academic essay that I had published. So it was like was using academic language but yes future videos more simple lastly there is so much more information and details that i couldn't convey in this video i really was just pulling out the things that were necessary for me to compare the violence non-violence thing but yes there's a lot more detail and nuance in there future videos on this channel they are going to be about similar topics like this like indigenous and environmental stuff and then within that, I'm going to make a lot of videos on white positionality and how to be a good ally and not a definitive guide because I don't know, but I'd like to get guest speakers on uh, to talk more about that and explore it more in depth than I even could. And also just like fun stuff. I'm really into a lot of kind of random things as much as those are my academic interests. And last note, sorry, final last note, I swear, is I, um, if you're wondering about like my credentials, and you don't need credentials in order to say anything, literally anyone can do research. Just to disclaim, I guess, my air of authority, I'm going into my sixth year <laughs> undergraduate studies. I will graduate eventually, um, but all that to be said, I, you know, have been learning about this stuff for a long time, specifically political science, indigenous studies, and environmental studies, and how those all intersect. So, yes, that is all. Thank you very much, and I hope you come again. And I hope you have a great day. Lots of love. Okay, bye.